we're going to have some fun. <laughs> I am a storyteller. And today we're going to hear the story about two families, my mother's family and my father's family, and how they came to the United States at the turn of the 20th century and what their life experience was as immigrants, getting established in California, building a family, building their relationships with their communities, uh, what the war experience was like, and then how their life was after the war. So today, I'd like to um, spend a little time kind of talking mostly about them as people. And so this is not ne necessarily a historical treatise, although history is a big part of this. It's not just a personal account, although that is the major driver of it, but rather it's integrating historical fact and um, social, economic, and political drivers that influenced how my family became established in California. This all began when we asked my mother to help us write her life story. My father had a different personality, and he had no problem writing his life story. <laughs> and my mother felt, well, Dad already told his story. I'm part of that story. That's good enough. And my siblings and I said, no, that's not right. When you have bookends, you have a left and a right. You can't just tell one part. The books fall over. We need to have both stories. So very reluctantly, she agreed. So this is my mother. She's 93. And what she really decided to do once we decided that the story was one which we would tell together because I helped her was that she wanted to write a story for her grandchildren because she wanted her grandchildren to meet her parents and her siblings. And then so as a concept, when putting this, thing, uh, this, uh, this project together, I thought, well, yes, but I actually want to go a little further than that. So I envisioned my youngest nephew, who was about 30 at the time, and he was just about to have his first son. So I envisioned this 30-year-old uh, nephew of mine at the age of 60 meeting with his grandchildren and talking about his great-great-grandparents. I wanted to have some continuity. So yes, I wanted to tell my mother's story to her kids, but I envisioned it going further. So I'd like to introduce you to my mom's grandkids. These two little boys are half uh, Guatemalan, one quarter Northern European, and one quarter Asian. <laughs> and their names reflect their ethnicity. The first one, his, name, his first name is Elliot for the Northern European, Rafael for the Guatemalan, and Shibata. So his name kind of tells his whole story. <laughs> and this other, um, other two uh, uh, grandchildren of my mother's are, um, uh, their parents are um, each respectively half Asian and half Northern European. Now in Japanese American slang, uh, we have the term hapa, half half. So they're half of one ethnicity, half the other. Now since these two kids have parents who are both hapa, I call them my hapa hapas. <laughs> These young ladies are actually um, part of my uh, Calabash family. They're my cousin's grandkids. And so, I mean, we th I think they're second cousins twice removed or something like that. But, or, but um, they are respectively from left to right half Irish, half El Salvadorian, and half Vietnamese. <laughs> and this young man is also half Irish, so this picture doesn't really do him justice, but he has beautiful red hair. And when he was a kid, he noticed that his hair was red and all his cousins had, you know, different shades of brown or black. And I told him that one day women are going to envy his hair because they spend a lot of money <laughs> trying to look like that, a lot of money. And this young lady is half Mexican, half Asian. So when my family goes out to dinner, we confuse hostesses because we all go up to the, to the, uh, uh, the podium where they're trying to seat us, and they look around and they ask, and how many are in your party? Because we don't really look like a match set, you know, so, <laughs> so well, well, we are, though. We are a match set. So it's for whom, it's for these kids that these, these books, this book was written. And it's for them and their, and their descendants because they're going to have El, Sal El Salvadorian uh, grandparents or great-grandparents. They're going to have Guatemalan. They're going to have Vietnamese. They're going to have Mexican. And they're going to have this really rich heritage and this really rich life experience. And I wanted to contribute that by helping my, them tell the story about the Asian side of their family. So as I wrote this book, I really got to see it, my grandparents, in a totally different light. I mean, as a child, they looked like this to me. They had gray hair. They spoiled us. We always got cake. We got to go play with them on, on, on in the fields and the farm because they were farmers. Uh, we used to go out and help pick strawberries, but that really meant that you let the grandkids pick the best ones because they'd get a basket full, and the biggest ones were eaten by the time you got back to the house. But that was okay because that was part of being a grandparent on a farm, right? We got to play with the pigs and the horses, and we had a wonderful time. So that was my memory of my grandparents. But in telling the story, I met them as young adults. 
So in this photograph, my grandmother is about 21. My father's about, grandfather's about 26. And that is my oldest aunt, who looks like she's prob probably be somewhere between one and two. And then all of a sudden, I started thinking back. Because when I wrote this book, I was in my 60s. So all of a sudden, I met this young couple. And I saw this young couple with the future ahead of them. They left their home countries because they wanted a better life for their, their children. And they came to a new land where they didn't know the language, they had few friends, and yet this is their country of choice. And they raised a family. And I watched them gr grow up, and I watched them grow old together. So my grandfather was 19 when he first came, and then he started off as a tenant farmer, I mean as a, a farm laborer, then he eventually became a tenant farmer, eventually a landowner. And then when he had enough income to justify uh, uh, getting married, he, um, he married my grandmother. And she actually, being six years younger, was actually the younger daughter of a friend. So he, my grandfather wrote to Japan and said, I am ready now to be able, uh, and can't afford to, to have a wife. Would your younger sister be interested in life in a new country? Now, it was interesting to me, he didn't write to her. <laughs> and it's interesting to me, he didn't write to her parents, but he wrote to his friend. And his friend then took the story to his parents. Again, he didn't take it to his sister. He took it to his parents. And they all agreed before they even reproached my, my grandmother that this would be a good choice should she choose to follow through. And she was plucky. You know, she decided, yes, this sounds like a good idea. She was actually middle class. She was actually high school educated, which is unusual at the time. Her brother was a mining engineer. Another brother was a ship's captain. And, and so here she was going to leave and then become the wife of a farmer. And this is the turn of the century. And life was hard for farmers in the turn of the century. And yet she did it with great joy, and she did it with a great spirit of adventure. So together they raised eight children. Typical farm family. But what wasn't typical is there were seven girls and one boy. Oh. And the boy was in the middle. And you'll hear more about him later. He was a really good man. So the eldest became a professional musician. She played the piano. Um, she, uh, the, they had three daughters that went to uh, college before the war broke out. This is the middle one who became a scholar. Uh, the second daughter to go to college was basically a, an athlete at heart. She lettered in two sports in high school. And when she went to Mills, she became an archer and, and was the only one in school who was actually a master archer. And the one boy, the one boy, of course, um, in addition to his responsibilities on the farm, um, he played baseball and golf. He played golf. And as Kent and I were discussing earlier, he was an avid hunter and an experienced hunter. Because in those days, if you wanted meat on the table, my uncle was the one who brought it back. Quail, duck, deer. And um, he also was an avid fisherman, and he would bring that back. Otherwise, they, you know, just like many farmers at the, tr at the uh, early years of the last century, they grew their own food, and they had their own chickens and pigs. And so this uh, hunting was not just sport. It was how it actually helped feed the family. So you could see from those photos that the kids took every advantage of being American kids. They played, they played sports. They they, learned, they became um, musicians, they became scholars. I mean, the, this country was rich with opportunity, and they took advantage of it. But not all uh, opportunities were available to my grandparents. So the uh, federal and California state law prevented them the rights of citizenship and land ownership. Uh, there was a law passed in the first Congress of the United States, 1790. It was called the Naturalization Act. And in that act, it said that unless you were a free white person, you could not become a naturalized citizen. That act was in place until 1952. So from 1790 until 1952, people from Japan and most parts of Asia could not become naturalized citizens. That law was amended a couple of times, by the way. Once in um, 1870, so that African Americans could become naturalized citizens. And when you think about history, that makes sense because many African Americans served in the Civil War and this was a way to honor their valor and their, and their sacrifice. And again, it was a, the law was amended in 1942, so Chinese could become uh, naturalized citizens. We were allies with China during that war, so that was uh, the, kind of the motivation behind that. So this is a copy of the actual legis legislation. You can see that it specifically calls out a free white person. And you can also see the date was March 19, uh, 1790, March 26, 1790. So what that meant was, is that as a farmer, my grandfather was going to be um, limited to uh, always being someone else's tenant. But what also, what, but what, so what many families did is they took one of two paths. One path was to buy property in the names of their children, because the children being born in the United States 
were American citizens. Because the law in California in 1913 stated that only American citizens can own property. So the immigrant parents, by definition, since they weren't American citizens, could not own property. So that law uh, was passed in 1913. It was called the Webb Hartley Law, and that was amended uh, seven years later because what folks began to do is lease land. They didn't own it, but they had long-term leases. So they tightened up the legislation in 1920, so leases were limited to three years. Now, so for those of you that come from farming families, you know that when you improve property, you know, t you really get it going after about three years. So as soon as you get it in a, in a very um, productive state, then you have to leave because your lease has ended. So what other families did is they purchased land in their children's names. So my father's family, that's what they did. Their land was owned in their children's name. And my, in this particular side of the family, though, the, per the land was purchased. Um, this is the farm. The family still um, owns the farm. Five generations of the family have been raised on it, so it's still in, in, California. It's in California, in central California, halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. The question was, is where in the California is the farm? Um, and so what they did is they found some Caucasian friends who would purchase the land and hold it until the children became of age, of legal age. And so the stock certificate shows that not too long after the oldest daughter turned 18, they transferred the stock to her, and so the family finally had control over the property. Now, um, being a researcher, one of the things I did is I looked up the original lease because it was in the county records. And so I knew what the mortgage rate was, I knew what the mortgage was. And um, long ago, I learned how to multiply. And so I could figure out what the mortgage, mortgage payment should be. I also found the family checkbook. And I looked at the amounts of the checks that were written. And the amounts of the checks that were written and the amounts of the mortgage payments did not match. The checks were in, uh, the amounts were in excess of what the payments were due. So there were some under the table dealings that were part of the, the transaction. So to get someone to buy the property for you, you did have a business agreement, but then you had the off the books agreement as well. So that my, uh, my grandfather, like many members of the Japanese community, just worked hard. They worked hard within their own community, and they worked hard within the community at large. When I say within their own community, remember, these are immigrants who don't have, a, in many cases, don't have a lot of education, don't have any assets. So when it comes to wanting to think, do things like buy a plow or a horse, you can't just go to a bank and borrow money. So often they loaned each other money. They had informal mechanisms as well. So the Japanese community was very important to them for not just social support, but also economic support. But the community at large was very important because this is when your new home. So they got to know bankers. They got to know churches. My grandfather actually helped found a Methodist church. There were many Japanese that were Methodist, not just Buddhist. Um, there were many um, Japanese that were Christian overall, not just Methodist. I didn't mean to imply that. So he helped to found... Um, uh, uh, business cooperatives. He helped to f um, he helped to found churches. He helped to found schools. Um, he was really active and acknowledged for that. And this is one of his friends who also had the same philosophy. There are many first generation immigrants that felt that they really needed to to be part of a community. You had to contribute and say, look, there are many ways that they which they could actually be part of it. And as a, as a business person, um, my grandfather's farm began to really um, um, become very productive in the 30s during the Depression. And there were a lot of people with small holdings that suffered because as, well, as a small farmer, you got up in the morning, you checked your livestock, you uh, made sure that you set your water, you had to also worry about harvesting, packing, shipping, finding a customer, selling the product, collecting money. That's a lot for one person to do, right? And so some of the smaller farmers were struggling with the, with the kind of roller coaster pricing of products. And so my um, grandfather uh, represented, helped represent 17 farmers from one county, and then 17 farmers represented by the gentleman in the picture with him from another county got together, and they made a farming cooperative, a marketing cooperative. So the farmers had control of their property and what they planted and how much they planted, but, to, but they turned over the product to an or organization to find the best price, whether it be a local market, a regional market, or a national market to sell. And so they found the clients, they did the transaction, they collected the money, and they returned it to the farmers. So farmers, large and small, all received the same benefit from this. This program was so successful that the state of California mimicked it. And the state of California passed something called the California Prorate Act. And what it, uh, what it uh, described was um, it, it, it created an environment that if <coughs> two-thirds of the farmers representing 51% of the acreage chose to create a co-op, then the state would, would support that co-op. And of course, there were rules for, 
for, uh, there are mechanisms for dissolving it if, if it should prove unsatisfactory. So because these, um, these two counties had been cooperating together for three years prior to the passage of this legislation, there was a track record. And I just want us to also make clear that it wasn't just the Japanese farmers. Anybody could participate in the, in the co-op they put together, whether they be Portuguese or any other ethnicity or nationality. So the, the co-op that was, uh, was um, the marketing co-op that was uh, founded by the state was written up in national magazines as being a success because the, the depression, of course, wasn't limited to just California. I mean, people across the country were having to deal with these business issues. And so this magazine was trying, to, was trying to give visibility to the fact that co-ops could work if you got the right combination of people who trusted each other, had good business sense, and they actually put together the machinery that would protect everybody's interests. So, um, so, uh, so again, this co-op was not just uh, run by Asian Americans, but as you can see, you see the different farms and the name, different names. It was a combination of many folks. So that was, again, a, one of my, uh, my grandfather and his friends' uh, major philosophies is become part of the community. Make all ships rise in a rising tide. Everybody should help each other. So I picked, painted a picture of a man who, who was, uh, um, uh, just loved his friends and loved where he lived. And his life changed drastically in December 1941, the month Pearl Harbor was bombed. I show here a letter that was, dis that was dated two days before Pearl Harbor, December 5th, 1941. And my grandfather's identified as a person of interest should hostilities break out between Japan and the United States. He would brought, be brought in for questioning. And this map shows uh, where um, in the first 48 hours, uh, well, the first 24 hours of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 800 men were picked up. My grandfather was one of the 800. In the next 24 hours, an additional 400 men were picked up. So 1,200 individuals were picked up by the FBI. Now, as a, just as to give you a sense of the size of the population of the Japanese American communities, in the 1930s, if you look at the 1930s census, the Japanese Americans counted for less than 3% of the population of California. Less than 3%. And this was 85% of the entire population of the United States. So for the FBI to have identified 1,200 people days before Pearl Harbor meant that someone was concerned and someone had a worry. And so they were putting together tracking mechanisms. So they showed up at 10 o'clock at night on the day of Pearl Harbor. And my grandfather, as, as you may have in, uh, picked up on the way I've described him, was a very social man. Um, and so he knew the county sheriff. It was a small town. Everybody knows everybody. So uh, the, um, the, um, around 10 o'clock on the evening of December 7th, um, the county sheriff came and, and brought two uh, men my grandfather didn't know to say hello. So uh, the way the Asian Americans were at that time is if you're greeting someone in your home, you don't greet them in just your, you know, your, your comfy, clean clothes. He went back into his room and he changed into his suit. And he came out and he greeted these two strangers wearing his, his best clothes. And he invited them in. And they said that given the circumstances of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they're wondering if he could help them by just answering some questions. So my grandfather left with them that night. And as they were going out the door, the FBI agent suggested my grandfather go back and get his coat. Because my grandfather wasn't sure what was happening. He didn't really understand, I think, at that point what was happening. When he left that home that day, um, he, there were members of the family that didn't see him for another two years. So he was taken to the county jail, and, and nobody knew where he went. And then from the county jail, he was taken to a CCC-converted camp in Southern California, which was a detention center. And then from there, he was brought here to Fort Missoula. From Fort Missoula, he was moved um, many times to um, various camps. He moved six times in two years. So when he was in Fort Missoula, they had um, alien, enemy alien hearings. And in those enemy alien hearings, the objective was to determine how much of a threat, if any, the individual was, these 1,200 folks. Now, for those of you that are familiar with local history, um, uh, you may remember that they had Germans and Italians at Fort Missoula as well. The difference is that the Germans and the Italians throughout the war were targeted individuals who were, the cases were made for against them for specific reasons. As the story proceeds, you'll, you'll see that the entire Japanese American community on the West Coast was swept up. So it wasn't just individuals. It was, a, it was an entire group. Now, so in these hearings, um, you know, the, in the published record, um, you can kind of get a, a sense for what was happening. And this print is too small for you to read, but the essence is, is that the person who was, was part of the hearing must have had a certain amount of sympathy after he got to know my grandfather. 
because in essence what he's saying is that um, uh, were it not for the political climate on the West Coast, the country might be better served as if, in, if this individual were allowed to go home and raise food. You know, he's a, he was a good farmer and he was a good community member. But because of the circumstances, he was detained. So while my, my grandfather was being treated um, on one track, you know, with the uh, INS and the Department of Justice, um, meanwhile, plans were being made to, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to work uh, with the, uh, the Japanese-American community, which at that time was about 120,000 people. So uh, President Roosevelt, FDR, uh, signed an executive order on February 19, 1942, just a couple months you know, after Pearl Harbor. And in that executive order, he gave the U.S. military the authority to define areas within the United States from which people may be excluded. To define areas within the United States from which people may be excluded. Now that translated into forced removal, as you will learn. So at, kind of the, the, at, a, at a high level, um, the uh, West Coast was divided into two, two uh, military areas. Roughly 100 miles wide from the Canadian border to the Mexican border was military area one. And if you, so within that military area, initially 104 exclusion orders were issued by the military, saying that people, had to, people of Japanese ancestry had to leave. They had to leave this 100 mile strip. Now for a while there, folks were allowed to leave voluntarily and as long as they left this area, this designated area. And so it so happens that both sides of my family chose to leave their homes and go outside into what was then known as military area two. This was allowed up until about the end of March. And then uh, the state of California and the military began to get pressure from other states saying, well, we really don't want the Japanese coming into our states. And so military area one and military, then they added military area two to the exclusion area. So another two, f another four exclusion areas were, uh, n another four ex uh, exclusion orders were issued. So there were 108 in total. So my mom's family um, moved from San Luis Obispo on the coast, again, be halfway between LA and San Francisco. They moved to the Central Valley, where all the grapes are now. It used to be where they grew rice and corn. And a German-American um, uh, um, decided that he didn't like the way the Japanese Americans were being treated. So he offered to let my family lease 10 years, 10 acres, for as long as they wanted and live out to live there until the end of the war. And um, so I went to that community because I was curious about this man who, who gave this opportunity to my family. Gave him a place, gave him a place of sanctuary, gave him a place where they could continue to farm, and he actually was a very brave man because the newspapers were uh, very hostile to the having Japanese uh, families move into the area, but he was uh, uh, a man who had large land holdings, and he told his community that this was his land, it's his decision, he would do what he felt was right. So we were forever grateful that he gave us that opportunity. In the meantime, on the farm. There, were, there was a, a neighbor farmer who was of Portuguese descent, and he said he would keep an eye on the farm for us when we left. On my dad's side of the family, we had an Italian-American family who watched our nursery because we grew up cut flowers, and he watched that nursery for the duration of the war while we were gone. So in these two cases, as, as I'll, I'll spend more time on this later, when the war was over, my, both my sides of the family had assets to return to so they can earn a living. Most families, and, and this of the 120,000 we're about to talk about, lost everything. If let's say you were a shop owner and you had a, a grocery store and, um, uh, and the uh, exclusion order, which you will see in a moment, gave you seven days to pack up your life. And so you would sell as much inventory as you could. If you owned the building, you would try to sell it. If you leased the building, then the lease would run out. Um, and then because uh, if you were given seven days on day eight, what would happen to anything that was left in that store? Yeah, it would be looted, right? So you try to convert as much of your belongings as possible into cash. So this is an example of those f one of the first 104 orders. As I mentioned, the four orders were added to that. So a total of 108 exclusion orders moved 120,000 people within uh, three and a half months off their homes. So the Japanese communities on the West Coast that had taken two generations to build in less than four months were turned into ghost towns. So one of the things that uh, I also mention is um, there was some research done later on, which I will refer to in more detail. Um, a, co a congressional commission was convened in 1980 to investigate this whole process and why it even came about. And it is estimated by this think tank, a Washington think tank, 
that between three and six billion dollars in 1970s dollars, between three and six billion dollars in assets, that doesn't even include loss of income, but assets were lost in this process because people had to vacate their homes. They had to vacate their, their cars, their farm equipment, their, their shipping boats, um, all these different things that they acquired. So for this exclusion order, again, this is an example that we dealt with, it calls out that it applies to both alien and non-alien people of Japanese ancestry. Both alien and non-alien. Now, I, I mentioned earlier the Naturalization Act of 1790. So by definition, those folks that could not become naturalized citizens were the aliens. My grandparents were all aliens. I struggled a little bit with a non-alien. Can anybody tell me what a non-alien is? A non-alien was a U.S. citizen. So I think when they first drafted this document, it felt wrong to them to say, aliens and U.S. citizens of Japanese descent must leave. So they coined a term. So I am a non-alien. Two-thirds of those individuals, by the way, were under the age of 18. So there are many different types of camps. Uh, many of you may have heard of the war relocation camps. There were 10 of those. Um, but what many don't know about the two other types, uh, two other major categories, actually. The one category were the camps run by the Department of Justice, um, that, for example, like Fort Missoula. Um, the other was temporary detention centers. So I mentioned earlier that my parents, both sets of parents, moved away from the areas because they, they thought they had the freedom of choice to do that. And then when <coughs> it was discovered that th there were people moving and that was something that made a lot of people uncomfortable, the military as well as people in areas to which they were moving, then um, the uh, military made a decision to create temporary detention centers. And there were 17 of those. And they ran roughly in operation from April to October 1942. So folks had between 48 hours and seven days to prepare to go to these detention centers before they were later moved to these longer-term camps. The longer-term camps, for the most part, were in the desert. There were two that were in the swamps. And so these, that's what you'll see pic, uh, pictorialized here, is the Department of Justice camps, the war relocation authorities, the temporary detention centers, and there are a few other types that um, I don't want to go into too much time here because there are nuances that we don't have the time to cover. So most people, as I mentioned, had seven days. But there were two incidents where groups only had 48 hours to prepare. Bainbridge Island, which is near Washington, and Terminal Island, which is off the coast of Southern California. Because of, I guess because they were, they were often they were fishermen and they had boats, uh, because of their, um, um, just their proximity near water, that they were given less time to prepare than others. So you're allowed to leave with what you could carry. You also were given, uh, you also had to operate under a curfew. From 8 in the evening till 6 o'clock at home, you had to be at home. So you had 48 hours or one week to prepare w with a limited amount of daytime hours available to you. And your assets were frozen. So if you went to the bank to try to withdraw cash, you weren't able to do that. So, you were, uh, so I think there, there were a lot of business issues that were going on. Um, there was obviously a lot of, uh, of social conflict, um, trying to figure out what to do, um, people trying to help. Um, I'm going to tell throughout this presentation there are stories of remarkable people who stood up to try to give my family assistance. I mentioned the farmer who, who allowed them to, who leased them land. The, uh, the Portuguese farmer who ran my, my one family's farms, the Italian farmers that ran the other's nurseries. I mean, a lot of people stepped up. They did their best in the limited circumstances to try to help us make this really awkward and very quick transition. So you can see, as I mentioned earlier, people were selling very quickly because when that eighth day came, they lost whatever was left was going to get lost. And when you reported to the deten uh, reported to the debarkation points, dis no disembarkation. Someone help me. What's the right word? Disembark. When you reach the point where you left for the, can you? Thank you. That was right. That was right. Okay. I should have rehearsed that before I started this present. <laughs> so when you reach the disembarkation point, you had your two little suitcases, whatever you could carry, and um, you had your kids and you had tags, because you didn't want your children to get lost. Again, uh, you've got an entire racial ethnic group on the move in a very short period of time. And so they didn't want kids to get you know, separated from their parents because when you see pictures of trains and stuff, you know, it really gets very, very chaotic. 
So I, I spend a lot of time with kids. I, I love dealing with, as well as dealing with adults, talking to school children. And when I ask them about how do you prepare to leave your home in two weeks, um, what do you take with you? Well, they always put their iPod on the top of their list. That's, that's <laughs> always a high on their list. And eventually they work through you know, their clothes and their, and their favorite snacks. And then I ask them, well, what do you do about your dog or your cat? And they say, oh, that's easy. I'll ask my grandmother to take care of them. I say, well, your grandma's going with you, so you can't. And then the room erupts because then the reality of how disrupted their life was settles in. So um, um, the kids are really perceptive. I love talking to seventh graders because they really understand. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I like to emphasize is um, valor and courage. And I'll talk about military valor and courage a little bit later, but I want to talk about the courage and the, and, 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 and the generosity and, and, the, and the strength of the human heart. So you as parents, your parents, your grandparents, Imagine your kids or your grandkids coming up to you saying, well, Mom, I'm all packed. Uh, where are we going? You don't know. Well, how long are we going to be gone? You don't know. Why do we have to go? That's a tough one, too. Nobody was ever charged, by the way, throughout this experience. People were not charged with the crime. And then lastly, when are we going to come home? You know, these are all questions that you can't answer. And yet the Issei, the first-generation parents, manage that with a great deal of grace and, and, cor and courage. And, and because what you want is, is that you know you're going to come home. You know the war cannot last forever. These parents had a long view of this experience. I'm often asked, well, why weren't there massive riots? Why, you know, why did you allow this to happen? There are 120,000 people. You've got the entire countries at war. There's great fear. There's great hostility. And the folks knew that you know, sometimes there's a time to come out of the rain. And this is the time. You just have to let things play out. And we'll, we'll do the best job we can and, the, and, and, and under the circumstances we can because we're eventually going to have to come home. These are the people we're going to have to live amongst. So we're going to handle ourselves with dignity and we're going to live our lives the best we can because one day this will end. There are many Japanese terms. There's a term called shikatakanai, which means it can't be helped. And uh, in generations now, four or five generations later, they misinterpret that. They think that that's giving up. It can't be helped. There's nothing I can do about it. When in fact, if I were to put another English interpretation on it, this too shall pass. Right? And so you've got these immigrant parents that saying, this too shall pass. We need to just do the best we can. And that's what's happening here. People are leaving in peace and as much as they can, with as much dignity as and as much um, um, community cohesion as possible because the entire community is being evaluated, not just in individuals. So when I deal with students, and I'm, I'm going to ask you the question as well, is that from um, a governance point of view and a logistics point of view, um, imagine yourself now, I'm going to deputize you as, as a city planning council. So you are going to build a facility. I'm going to give you... Um, uh, a square mile in the desert. And with the kids, because they don't know what a square mile means, I have them pace out. Uh, they walk for 15 minutes, make a right turn, walk another 15 minutes, make several right turns, and that is, in their mind, their community, that is a mile. Then I have them remove everything man-made. No homes, no streets, no street lights, no schools, no shopping centers, no nothing. Remove everything green. No trees, no lawns, no shrubbery. Put mountain ranges on either side crank the temperature up to about in the 90s, and put into, again, a 30-mile-an-hour wind. Take that one mile you paced out, put up barbed wire, eight guard towers with armed guards pointing their guns inward, and now I want you to build a community because within the next few months, you're going to have 10,000 people arriving, two-thirds under the age of 18. Create a community. What are your priorities? What do you need? How do you begin? And you're going to end up with something that kind of looks like this. This happens to be Manzanar. This is Manzanar in Southern California. That's Mount Whitney, the tallest peak in the United States. And this is, happens to be where part of my family was, was kept. And the kids are really good. They, they talk about setting up um, housing. They want to provide food. They uh, worry about infrastructure, electricity, water, and so on. They never, they, even reluctantly, they come up with schools. You know, they end up with hospitals, 
they don't quite get governance. They don't think of the idea of how do you run a camp like this. But you know, I don't expect them to do it at 12. Um, but they do a really, really good job. And so um, these barracks were built about one every four hours. Uh, they were built with green wood. So as you can imagine, as the wood seasoned and shrank, then you get gaps, right? There's part uh, tar paper covering uh, the walls. There's no insulation. Um, each room is about 20 feet square for one family. You have a light bulb, a pot belly stove, a wire camp cot, and an, uh, the, uh, a tick that you need to go to fill with straw to bring home. Right? And you're carrying your belongings with you. Right? And so that you have to make home out of this. Now, eventually, as time went by, some people had friends bring them some furniture from their homes and so on. So th and they became, folks became very creative um, in, in customizing these folks. But initially, when you came, that's what you were dealt with. That, that was the, the hand that you were dealt. So these camps um, came up very quickly, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, we're talking about the 10 war relocation camps. And the first, by the way, the first uh, director was Milton Eisenhower, who was um, our, pre our future president's brother. And after a few months, he resigned, because once he understood what it was all about, he didn't want anything to do with it, so he left. <coughs> so the priority for the Issei, again, the parents, the ones who at the time were in their 40s and their 50s, they wanted to immediately establish a routine. They wanted to create some sort of uh, social stability for these children. And, and so they, they created, um, um, they created um, scout troops. So here's a Boy Scout troop. They started schools. They started, they had, they started churches. They started um, baseball teams, basketball teams, soccer teams, anything to kind of fill the day. Because, again, you're in one square mile, and you can't li live. I'm uh, sorry. You can't leave. So what do you do with these boisterous kids in one square mile when there's no place to go. So you have to create something. They had dances. They did, you know, they did all sorts of things. And also from the camps, you may, uh, we'll cover this in more detail in a few, in a few slides, 33,000 men and women f during the war and then post-war served, served the war effort, either in uniform or as civilians. So a lot of these young adults came of age, and they chose to go serve their country to prove that any question about the loyalty of the Japanese Americans was put to bed once and for all. And I'll go into much more detail about that in a moment. So my mother attended four high schools. She was uh, 15 years old when the war broke out, and so she was a sophomore in high school. And when Executive Order 9066 was signed, I mentioned that February 19, 1942, she, she was bullied and harassed a lot at school, so she dropped out of school. This is a young woman whose three older sisters went to college and had a dream, starting at age of five, of going to Mills. Her first sister went to Mills when she was five, the second sister when she was seven, the second when she was 11. So in her mind, when she was of age, she would go to college. So my grandmother allowed her to drop out of school because of, of, uh, of how upset she was. But the older sisters came back to her and said, you said you wanted to go to Mills. That, you know, don't let go of that dream, but you can't go to Mills without a high school education. So she eventually went back to high school, and I'll tell more about that as well. So in the beginning, we, we talked about how quickly these camps were thrown together. Well, they wanted to put together the schools. Well, they didn't have, um, they had, didn't have uh, books, they didn't have blackboards, they didn't have chairs, they didn't have pencils, and they didn't have teachers initially. And so what happened was, of the adults, anybody who had any college education was conscripted. My father, who's 10 years older than my mom, was, w became a, a teacher. And he was so ill-equipped as a teacher, but he tried his best. And then eventually they were able to recruit really dedicated individuals. We're talking about kindness. I mean, if you look at the papers and newspapers at the time, teachers were in, in demand. And so for a teacher to, uh, get, uh, to choose to go to out in the middle of nowhere to teach a bunch of dis disenfranchised people as opposed to having a more comfortable job in town, I mean, that's a very special person, right? And yet teachers came. And one good example was Kent's, Kent's uncle. Kent's uncle was a teacher and then became the superintendent of schools within one of the camps in Idaho and within um, at Minidoka. So people like, so again, I go back to kindness and people doing what they consider the right thing. People did try to help. So my mother's journey was a very, uh, was uh, a disruptive. This was my grandfather's, you saw. So she started off on the farm. 
they went to that, uh, their farm. They went to the farm in the Central Valley where they thought they'd be allowed to stay until the war was over. And then when the military areas expanded, they had to leave a second time. And they didn't have much time. They only had a few days. So then they decided to go. They might as well enter the, 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 incar the incarceration camp, which was in Manzanar. So my mother, uh, because of the school, was so informal and ad hoc, she was afraid that sh that, that would not be recognized by colleges and universities after the war, that wouldn't be recognized as a legitimate high school. So um, she was really anxious and kind of worried about that. In the meantime, um, I had other aunts and uncles that were married before the war and had settled in other parts of the country. Uh, one aunt was living in Oregon, and she was at the, stock, uh, the Portland Stockyards. That was the detention center she was sent to. And after 10 days, people started to get really sick because they just threw linoleum down on top of the floor. And unsurprisingly, not surprisingly, people began to get ill. Well, at the same time that all this was happening, um, it, was, uh, it, it became patently obvious that there weren't enough farm workers in the field because the guys were all fi are fighting, right? They're all for war. And so sugar beets were needed to be harvested. They needed to be thinned. Other crops needed to be harvested. So then um, um, it became um, obvious that they were going to rot in the, in the fields. So they allowed Japanese Americans to leave the camps to go work in the fields. So uh, my aunt and her uncle went, went to the, um, into uh, Oregon and were hoeing beets. And while they were doing that, one of the farmers who was actually in financial trouble of his own um, uh, suggested that my, my aunt and uncle buy his farm. And um, he thought if they bought the farm, then they'd, he'd f they'd forgive the debt that he owed <laughs> because he wasn't making any money and stuff. Well, so the idea seemed ridiculous at the time, but my aunt and uncle were part of a work crew of 20, and the 19 other folks suggested that, well, why don't you try? Because if you try, we'll stay with you, and we'll help you work this land. Because it's one thing to have a farm. It's another thing to have someone to work it. And labor was at a shortage, right? There was a labor shortage. So these other incarcerees said, please do that. We'll, we'll support you. So my aunt and uncle went and to the first bank, and not surprisingly, the, they were turned down. I mean, who's going to loan money to a Japanese-American during wartime? Well, my uncle was a very intrepid individual. He was one of these nothing is impossible types. So he had a little list of people to go visit. And second time around, I'll be darned, someone loaned him money. And it, again, it was, a German, it was a, a man of German descent. So again, another act of kindness. Someone didn't have to do that. So they bought uh, a really um, a 50 acres on, on the Snake River uh, on the Oregon side. And so they, they established themselves in the, it was that farm the guy was failing on, right? right? So they bought that farm. They got a loan from the government to build temporary housing. So they built housing for these 19, they happened to be all men, and they brought their families out of the camps. So at the same time, my aunt made it possible for my mother and her mother and her, my mom's brother um, to leave the camps and go to Oregon to go work on the farm. So this is a kind of a, an example of family unity because the aunt who got this farm, um, the farm... Uh, the way I like to s describe it is that the farm was a very good producer of rocks. <laughs> that was the best crop that came out of that farm. So for quite a while, the first thing I had to do was clear the land, level it, irrigate it. And so they had these, uh, f uh, these uh, other families as well as my family helping them do that. Now, even though my mom and my aunt were raised on a farm, they were actually kind of like weekend farmers, you know, the <laughs> And so when they got on the fields and they were hoeing the beets, um, they were really uh, hmm, unskilled. And so the other folks were actually experienced farmers because they ran their own farms before the war. So as my aunt and my mother were, hoe were we hoeing the beets, they would go up a row, and the folks on the row next to them would go up one row, come back, and then pass them a second time <laughs> while they were still going. And my uncle was mortified. He was mortified, so he fired him. He fired my aunt and, and her sister. And so, 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 so my aunt and my, and my, uh, my mom were, you know, thought, well, we can't live on this farm and, and just eat. You know, that's not good because it's not making any money. They're feeding these 19 people. My aunt brought in three uh, of her nephews that were orphaned. And, I mean, we need to earn our living. So they ended up getting jobs as housekeepers in Boise, Idaho, because they knew how to clean a bathroom, and they knew how to the basics of cooking. But was, what was interesting about that, that my mom was 19 at the time. Oh, that's another story. So she went to Ontario, Oregon entered in high school, enrolled in high school, and um, she, this was like in April, and they were supposed to graduate the next month. So she'd been, this is her fourth high school, right? And because she'd never been a full term any place, she didn't have a complete terms grades. She had papers, she had partial grades, but she didn't, couldn't say, for this semester I earned a grade in this. 
So I, I look, when I look through her, her file, they would say, well, she has um, uh, the uh, high school principal wrote and said, I need to, someone tell me something, you know, tell me more about this young lady. Um, but nobody could tell her because these, these records were incomplete. Nonetheless, he let her graduate from high school. Another act of kindness. Now, when mom was in, on, w in the Central Valley and she w went to school where they had that um, temporary living situation, um, kids threw rocks at her. They put gum in her hair. I mean, they made life pretty rough for her. And, but she still was going to get her high school education. She dropped out once. She was not going to drop out a second time. When she went to Ontario, her expectations were lowered in starting at a new school. She just knew that. She knew what the worst case was. She didn't yet know what the best case was. So when she waited at the bus stop to get on the bus, uh, not surprisingly, when she got on the bus, all the kids put their books and their coats on the seats next to them so there are no vacant seats. And so this went on for two or three days, both to school and, and coming, returning home from school. And then one day she got on the bus, and the bus driver didn't start the bus, and she was wondering what's going on. And she, he kind of indicated with his, you know, kind of a flick of his, his, his head to, for her to turn around and look. And a young lady had lifted her coat and jacket off a seat and offered my mother a seat on the bus. And so from that day forward, she rode to school and from school sitting next to this young woman, and her name was Naomi. And that's how I got my name. So anytime someone I sign my name or someone calls me by name, I'm honoring that act, that simple act of kindness that changed my mother's life. So there were many individuals who showed kindness. These are my, my, my aunt's college roommate uh, when they went to Mills. Um, by the way, um, Japanese-American parents were very conservative, as you can imagine, immigrant parents. They were horrified to see that my aunts had bare ankles. <laughs> and they were wearing saddle shoes. This was really fast. You know, they weren't, they were, you know, and it wasn't so much that my, my grandparents cared, but their friends cared. Because when my aunts came home, they were influencing their friends to wear bare, have bare ankles and to wear saddle shoes. <coughs> this is the couple that rented land to, leased land to my, my family in the Central Valley. And this young woman's an interesting woman. Uh, so um, from Boise, my aunt and my mother weren't making enough money. So um, meanwhile, two other aunts had moved to Chicago. Again, long, complicated story because we have a lot of family members. And they said, why don't you send the two youngest daughters to Chicago? We'll watch over them, right? So my mother and my aunt got on a train from Boise to Chicago. It's about a 17-hour ride, I think. You know, I don't know. I have the old timetables, but it's pretty close. And when they got on the train, uh, they were frightened because it turned out the train was mostly, uh, the passengers were mostly soldiers. And um, there was an incident in the camp at Manzanar where a guard uh, shot and killed one of my mom's classmates. So anybody in uniform terrified her, right? And again, these, these two women, my mom and my aunt, were born and raised on this farm. They'd always lived with someone who was either related to them or their own family. They'd never been out in the open like this. So for them to be on this train tra traveling across the country was, was really frightening. So they very happily left the car and went to the back of the, the car and put down their suitcases and sat down and prepared for this, this long ride. And once the train was rolling, uh, a young man in uniform passed them, I guess on his way to the restroom, I'm not really sure, and then on his way back, he stopped and offered my mother his seat. And so she, you know, she, she was very shy and very embarrassed. So she thanked him and said, well, that's very kind of you, but I'm traveling with my sister, so really thank you for the offer. So the young man smiled and he left, but he returned, sh returned shortly with another soldier. And he said, two seats are available now. And so they sat on their duffel bags at the back of the train and they offered their seats to my, to my, my mother. So someone, someone raised those young men to you know, to have a feeling for others. And my aunt and my mother were nervous because, as I said, I mean, these men were being trained to fight people who looked like them, to kill people who looked like them. And so for them to, to, to reach out the way they did was a very moving experience. And I was said yesterday that they, those two young men must have been from Montana. <laughs> so this woman was, uh, ran a, uh, a school, uh, ran a, a facility in Chicago that trained people for the ministry, a Presbyterian ministry. And my aunt was a, an accomplished stenographer, so she was hired immediately as a secretary. Um, and room and board was part, of the, was part of the salary. So this woman offered my, my aunt uh, room and board, and my aunt turned it down again because what would she do with my mother, right? So she went back and said, thank you very much, but my sister's with me. We'll find, we'll find a boarding house or someplace to live. Well, this woman said, no problem, bring your sister. So she offered, and she let my mother live with her sister. They doubled up, and, and she gave her room and board. So as my mom went to school to learn to be a stenographer, um, she uh, helped make beds and do laundry and do whatever she could 
to help pay. But again, that woman didn't have to do that. So if, I'd like to acknowledge these people. I wish I had pictures of the soldiers as, as, and the woman who helped me get my name. There were so many people during these really tough times that reached out and, um, and, showed, and showed that they were going to act as they felt they should. They, they wanted to be treated in a certain way, so they treated my family the way they wanted to be treated. So I referred to earlier the, the 33,000 people who served during the Second World War. So nine of my extended family were in the Army. Um, none of them went into the Marines or the, or the Air Force, or you know, I'm not really sure why, but they all went into the Army. Um, one uh, went to Italy and died in combat, the man up in the upper, upper left-hand corner. The rest came home. Um, one was uh, uh, in a medic. Uh, one was in training uh, to be a paratrooper, and my dad was kept as a rifle instructor in boot camp. The others were went into the intelligence service, the military intelligence service. What many well, the story that's not often told is how the uh, Japanese were recruited by the within the army to put together um, a, a group of folks that could interrogate, translate documents, intercept, communicate, and help help with the war effort. So this the concept for this in the army came about around the. Um, so late spring, early summer of 1941. But the school was actually formed on November 1st, 1941. And it was on the Presidio in San Francisco in a, in a converted airplane hangar. And, and so on December 7th, when um, Pearl Harbor was attacked, the uh, school uh, was accelerated uh, to get these men out in the field. So at the time uh, when the initial uh, surveys were done, about 3,500 roughly uh, Americans of Japanese descent were serving in the U.S. military. And they were, um, they were tested for their language skills, and only 48 passed the first cut, because most of their language was conversational. And what you needed are people who could really read very sophisticated documents, and you had to have a very strong command of the language. So they brought them to the Presidio, and they put them through this grueling program, and their first class graduated in May the following year, May 1943, I mean May 1942. And they actually went in the field at the, en at the end of May 1942. I, remen I mentioned earlier that the, um, the um, um, Executive Order 9066 was signed in, in February 1942. So that included, uh, that excluded people of a Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. It also included the school. So the school in the summer had to move to Camp Savage, Minnesota, and then it grew and eventually had to move to Camp um, uh, uh, Fort Snelling. 6,000 people trained. 6,000 people trained and served again during the war and then afterwards and more about what they did, their service. So they, um, later in 2010, um, this was a secret organization. Um, much The documentation about it was not released until 1971. The Freedom of Information Act was passed in 1966, and yet documents about these men were not, men, and there were women too, mostly men, were not released until 71. Uh, and the Congressional Gold Medal is a civilian medal, and it's awarded to people who have contributed significantly to our culture and our country. And in this case, the language that was used in the legislation, because this legislation that has to be passed both in the House and the Senate, was to recognize Americans of Japanese descent for their patriotism, citizenship, courage, compassion, per perseverance, and humility. So there were two combat units, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and the 100th Battalion. And the 442nd is recognized as being the most decorated unit of its size and, and uh, duration of service. Other historians have said it's actually the most decorated unit, period. Don't take out the qualifiers of size and duration of service. So th that's still a point that you know, people are, are, are trying to pin down. And the military intelligence service um, uh, was um, a not a unit per se, so they were people were assigned to different parts of the military, so they didn't have what was re referred to as a unit designation. The 442nd um, uh, originally had uh, 4,500 people in it. Uh, after the military intelligence service was out in the field helping gather intelligence and interrogation and interrogate, then the government's position about the loyalty of Japanese Americans began to shift. These first 48 men changed the course of our history. Because what then the following February, they, they passed, uh, the president decided it was okay to have an all Japanese American combat team, and that's when the 442nd was, was created. So between the work of the 100th Battalion, which was a, 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 a Hawaiian group um, that was a, a spinoff from a National Guard unit, eventually the 442nd and the 100th combined. So between their activities in Europe and the military intelligence service in the South Pacific, that paved the way for people being able to receive us after the war. 
and uh, folks who joined these units, um, many joined voluntarily, many were already in the military, and later they were drafted. Their one goal, their one goal was to prove the loyalty of the Japanese Americans to this country. This is our country of choice for their parents. This is our country of birth for the Nisei. So going back to their declarations, the 442nd, um, um, by, the, by the time the war was over, 18,000 people had served. Um, and because the casualty rate was very high because they went on very high-risk missions. Um, so they received um, seven presidential unit citations, 560 um, silver stars, 4,000 bronze stars, 9,500 purple hearts. Um, individually, there were, um, in addition to the purple hearts and the bronze stars and silver hearts, silver stars, there were 21 medals of honor. Now, for those that are not familiar, the Congressional Gold Medal is a civilian award. The Medal of Honor is um, a, a military award, and it's for extraordinary valor. The, um, uh, the military intelligence service, though, even though it, does, it wasn't a unit, it was eventually awarded a, a presidential unit citation for, again, their war. General Charles Willoughby, Willoughby, who was a chief of intelligence for MacArthur, is quoted as accrediting the military intelligence service for saving a million lives and shortening the war by two years in the South Pacific through their work. So they worked with the Navajo code, co to code Talkers. So my uncles, as I mentioned, the ones who were in the service, they would, uh, through the means I described earlier, get intelligence information, give it to a Code Talker, who would then pass that over the open airs to another Code Talker who would translate it and then give it to the people who were in decision-making positions. Uh, military historians, those of you who are military historians, are familiar with the Z Plan. The Z Plan was, was Japan's strategy on how to win the war in the Pacific. Well, the, the U.S., uh, through capturing prisoners, got a copy of the Z plan, and uh, the intelligence officers, uh, the military intelligence officers, were the ones that translated that. One of the major victories in the South Pacific was the shooting down of Admiral Yamamoto's airplane. He was the highest ranking Japanese military man. So you have to ask, well, how did they know where he was going to be and when he was going to be? Again, that information was captured by the intelligence officers and through their translations. So that is. Um, that's how, that's the way that they distinguished themselves. So in 1944, it was decided that the Japanese Americans were no longer a threat and allowed to return home. Uh, we, again, because we had farm on one side of the family and a nursery on the other, we were able to return home and start earning a living again. So my parents got married. Um, they had a, um, a, what we call a baishakunin, a matchmaker, who introduced them together. Um, the, the, of the eight children, only two did not have matchmakers, and those were two that married during the war. And those were both very successful marriages, by the way. They raised a family, and we were raised on a cut flower nursery. I didn't have a pram, so I put my little brother in a flower cart and used to push him around the nursery. <laughs> uh, we, uh, same, just as our parents before us, we just jumped in and just enjoyed everything that life had to offer. I rode horses, both my brothers were, uh, ran track. My mom was a member of the PTA. You know, and then they had friends and they had partied, you know. So we did have our share of experiences where people discriminated against us. Sometimes people wouldn't sell property to us. It took us a while to find a house. But the majority of folks were very kind. And I like to credit um, a lot of the way that people deported, deported themselves in the camps. Um, I like to credit my uncles and everything they did in the war to make sure that people understood that when we came back, we were... Uh, American citizens that really took our, took our role as American citizens very seriously. And so we had a good life. So in 1980, it was, um, it w uh, President Carter convened a, um, a commission to investigate why did EO 9066 come about in the first place? Why was it, how was it possible that that came into place? And um, so over a period of years, 750 hearings were, were I mean, 750 testimony Testimonies were given across the country. In the meanwhile, we had people living in the, the National Archives digging up documents. And we found documents that were very revealing that, that actually the war, de the, the, uh, the war Department withheld documents from the President on what the threat the Nikkei actually possessed or posed. Uh, there was something called the Munson Report where FDR actually asked someone to go to the West Coast and do due, dili due diligence. Go to these communities and try to figure out what is the character of these communities. And he wrote, came back and he wrote back that, um, that the Issei have, have adopted this as their country of choice. The children are growing up as American and identify with being American more than being, being with Japanese. But he also wrote about things that were, um, were important to know. 
that there were installations that weren't necessarily well protected, you know, power installations or whatever. And so the, someone interpreted his report and wrote a cover letter. And what they emphasized in the cover letter was not that we were not a threat, but that, there were, there, that we had vulnerabilities. And so that actually worked against us rather than working in our favor. So this report, uh, so uh, as a result of all these hearings and these testimonies and these documents, this, this publication was put together, Personal Justice Denied, and there were five recommendations. And three had to do with compensation and the people who had jobs and civil service and benefits and all this kind of stuff. But the two that I'd like to emphasize today are a presidential apology to everybody who was incarcerated and redress is you know, putting some skin in the game, trying to recomp you know, compensate people for something of what they lost. And, but the most meaningful was, the original question was, how did EO9 9066 come about? What was it that made that possible? And the conclusion was that Executive Order 9066 was the direct result of race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So in the course of running this document, many people were interviewed. Um, and um, President Reagan um, you know, signed uh, the apology. And that apology was then issued um, by George Bush, the first George Bush. So I mentioned earlier that, that there were people that, when given hindsight, because again, 1980, this is 40 years later. 40 years later, 40 years later, looking back, People in positions of authority, people of in, in positions of influence, what did they think about Executive Order 9066? Francis Biddle was the U.S. Attorney General during the war. He was the top cop in the country. And this is a quote from one of his two autobiographies. In essence, I made a mistake. William O. Douglas was on the sat on the Supreme Court. There were three cases that we took to the Supreme Court. Um, and in two cases, it was a violation of curfew. And the third case, it was a failure to report uh, to that I am a Japanese American, therefore you have to, you know, you, I'm someone that you need to, to go on record as, as being, uh, need, that needs to be tracked by the Army. And he decided in all three, I mean, those three th these three cases all went to the Supreme Court and they were all upheld as being legal. And he was one of the individuals who voted to up uphold them. And years later, I made a mistake. <laughs> Earl Warren, governor of California, and also eventually a Supreme Court justice as well. I made a mistake. Then three others, a, a gentleman with the Justice Department and, and Western Defense Command, which is the Army, the director of the War Relocation Authority, and the Secretary of War all in essence said it was a mistake. So what happened to the family? You know, what, what happened afterwards? Well, my mom g eventually went back to college. She went back at the age of 64. She graduated 74. She went to Mills, like her three sisters. She got a bachelor's degree in English and got a whopping grade point average of 3.6. Uh, and she doesn't like me telling people that because um, she feels it puts too much pressure on her if she wants to go back to school and get you know, study again. My grandfather went back to the farm, was very happy on his tractor, went back to helping schools, went back to helping bus the business community. He was one of two people that also helped um, Japanese farmers become um, up educated and updated on mar modern um, uh, American farming techniques. The state of California put together a program to bring, bring bringing over interns. He, he found farmers in Southern California and a compatriot in Northern California did the same. So he remained socially active as ever. And so that I just want to put in a picture of my grandma looking happy. So they, they, they picked up their lives. And my grandmother went to many of our sporting events, didn't understand what they were about, but was happy for us anyway. <laughs> the sisters all married, had children, um, and all picked up a very active life. Um, their, their lives were all good. And then my parents, who always wanted us to appreciate other cultures and other people, became very active in a... Um, an organization with a local university which provided home uh, homestay programs. So an international student would have a place to stay when they first got off the plane and you, they, our homestay families would help them find an apartment, opening a checking account, get a car and so on. So we did that year after year, again, to, to remain broad. So this story that I just shared with you, I uh, mentioned I share with adults. 
um, I also share with children. There are 1,000 seventh graders at this one particular school that I'm invited back to on a regular basis. And I ask them each to um, write down for me a takeaway. So in your hour with me or your hour and a half, when people ask you when you walk out that door, what did you do in that hour with Naomi? What did you get out of it? What is the one thing you're going to tell them? And by the way, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Um, I'm going to share with you some of their comments. I should bend with the wind and not let it break me. These are 12-year-old kids. I learned to be proud of who I am no matter what the situation. Learning about the cultures of others is important to understand and have peace with others. We should learn this so it does not happen again. We are the future. It is amazing how even after the horrible way your grandparents were treated, they were able to come back and live a wonderful life. So in closing, I'd like to read a, 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 just a little passage from this book. And it, uh, it talks about the day my grandparents took the oath of allegiance and became naturalized citizens of the U.S. In December 1953, Grace packed her children in a bento lunch into the car and made the half-day drive to Los Osos. That was where the farm was. On Friday, December 18th, 70-year-old father and 64-year-old mother became naturalized citizens of the United States. The dream of a lifetime came true. The passage of the McCarran Walter Act of 1952 provided Asian immigrants with the right to citizenship. The sisters and I went to the San Luis Obispo County Courthouse for the naturalization ceremony. But before the family entered the classroom, the sisters applied a touch of lipstick and a little powder to their mother's face. Mother, unaccustomed to all the fuss and attention, gently batted away her children's, her, her children's hands. The sisters stood in a semicircle before their diminutive mother. She looked beautiful. Father and mother were the only individuals to take the oath of office that day. Superior Court Judge Ray B. Lyon was a friend, and the private ceremony was a priceless gift. Grace watched her parents as the proceedings began. It was a poetic moment. Her father stood tall and held his head high. Her mother stood quietly with her hands folded before her. Grace was grateful that father and mother had lived long enough to see this day. During the course of their lives, they had sacrificed much when nothing was promised in return. Together, they had established themselves in a new country. Together, they had made friends in the American and the Japanese communities. Together, they had raised a family. Together, they had survived bitter seasons of racism and bigotry and emerged without bitterness. And if they had to do it all over again, they would do so without hesitation. Grace heard her father speak, his words strong and clear. She could barely hear her mother over the timbre of father's voice. And that I take this obligation freely, without any mental res reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. The room was quiet for a few moments as the family absorbed the magnitude of what had just happened. The then spontaneous applause broke, the silence, and the family saw a wide smile break across Judge Lyon's face. It was done. A wait of nearly five decades was over. Father and mother were now citizens of the United States of America. Mother and her daughters followed Judge Lyon and father to the courtroom door. Judge Lyon stopped, placed his hand on the exit, and turned to father. He gravely reminded father that he was now an American citizen and a man with new responsibilities and obligations. Father listened respectfully. Judge Lyon opened the door and stepped aside. In the United States, he said, men allow women to precede them through open doors. <laughs> Father frowned. Judge Lyon made a courteous gesture to mother. She hesitated, but her bevy of unsmiling daughters marshaled her through the doorway. Once outside, Grace and her sisters secretly enjoyed their mother's bewilderment. Thank you for your time.